We do this report card on the Australian media each year. We try and look back at the year that's been and towards the year ahead. And when we started the new news uh, six years ago, we were really talking about three media groups as the main people that we used to check in with, Fairfax, News Corporation and the ABC. Now, this year, of course, we have a very different setup because one of the notable things about the Australian media in the last few years have been new entrants. And so I have, moving from left to right, on our left we have Andrew Holden, who is Editor-in-Chief of The Age, a publication which is 161 years old. Andrew, of course, is considerably younger than that. Sitting next to him, we have Tori Maguire, who's Editor-in-Chief of the Huffington Post in Australia, which is a whole eight weeks old in Australia, <laughs> older, of course, in its international um, iteration. And then we have Emily Wilson, who is Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian in Australia, which is two and a half years old in Australia, but, of course, again, much older in its print and international form, or British-based form. And finally, sitting immediately to my left, we have Simon Creerer, who's the Australian editor of BuzzFeed, two years old in Australia. Not yet, just a year and a half. A year and a <laughs> half. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Bad maths on my part. Um, so this is certainly one of the um, extraordinary things. For those of you who are wondering about the media organisations who aren't here, we did invite various people from News Corporation. Unfortunately, they declined or were unable to attend. And we didn't invite the ABC because we're rather ABC heavy this year with Mark Scott talking on Friday and uh, Sarah Ferguson giving the Ian Smith lecture last night. In preparation for this session, I asked these people to write me some listicles. Um, in I asked them to tell me uh, the issues that they thought were most important for the last year, the main challenges for the year ahead, their top gripe about the Australian media at the moment, and the thing that they were happiest about. And we got, came up with some very useful challenges and interesting challenges, which I'm hoping to get them to uh, bounce around. Andrew Holden, for example, the uh, oldest publication present, um, said that one of the main challenges was the intrusion of overseas media organisations. And of course, everybody else here represents those overseas media organisations, whereas Simon Creerer mentioned that as one of the most exciting things about the media. Emily Wilson said she loved all the new arrivals, and Tori nom nominated decentralisation as one of the things she was most excited about. Interesting, of course, that both Tori and Simon have in the past worked for News Corporation. So, and Andrew, is it really such a bad thing? Well, it was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> to be fair. But it's certainly, well, you can call it an issue, but it's certainly a, um, a hallmark of what's happening in the media industry, just as uh, the traditional beer moths are getting smashed, their business models are getting smashed. Um, in, and then the argument being that the media sector is being um, reduced significantly, and what does that mean for the future of journalism and the, and the future of journalists, of course? Um, you've got all these different organisations coming into what's supposed to be a decimated field and actually sprouting up and doing something new, and, of course, hiring journalists. And I'm a, I think Guardian was aiming for 50. I don't know what numbers you've got on the uh, ground now in Australia. 42 full-time. 42. Half Post is probably aiming for a, a 10 a double figures yet? Or quite yeah, we're, um, we're nearly at 20, yeah. but plans for rapid growth. Yeah. And... 25 we have today. 25. Yeah. So... You know, there's nearly 100 journalists that I'm not hiring in the past two years. In fact, Fairfax would have let that number go quite comfortably and News Limited, keeping it very quiet, would have done precisely the same as well. So, you know, it's a fundamental change, I think, in, in terms of the nature of the media. And, and quite frankly, at the end of the day, that has to be a good thing. Mm, but you've been shrinking your newsroom, really. Fairfax, I mean, not you, only you personally. The newsrooms have been shrinking, laying absolutely. off journalists at the Newcastle Herald and other regional papers. Yeah, absolutely, because because the money that we've been relying upon, which has been predominantly print-focused, mm. um, is drying up and is moving into the digital world. And so, you know, where organisations built upon an old business model, those dollars aren't there, and we fundamentally need to change. And that's you know that's one of the sad aspects of that sort of um, transformation. And Fairfax is. A 49% of the Huffington Post joint venture. Indeed. So that's so an acknowledgement of the change from Fairfax and mm. an investment in growth. So, Tori, will the Huffington Post eventually take over Fairfax? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just worry about the yarns. <laughs> Leave the business model to Chris Jans. So is... 
are we still looking at a nation which is dominated by news corporation media, which has been one of the truisms of media in Australia for all of my career? What do you think in terms of I reach I, or well, in terms of influence? Mm, that's a really interesting question because if you look at the, card, uh, the cold hard facts of where people are spending their time, they're arguably spending more time on Facebook than they are with traditional media mm. organisations. Mm. Um, and they can be supplied with all the basic news that they need to know on social media sites that have got, are being fed, obviously, by uh, traditional sites like us. Um, but they can stay in that world and find out all they need to know without going anywhere near a website or a newspaper of those traditional organisations. So you could argue that, in fact, the game has already flipped and you're starting slowly to see politicians like Mike Baird in New South Wales get that and start to speak directly to significant numbers of people mm. through those outlets instead of doing the classic old thing of scuttling off to Alan Jones and hoping that the parrot will, will provide the outlet for you. And in fact, you know, his audience is tiny, quite frankly, compared with even my audience, let alone something that you look at like Facebook. I think the political class is taking longer to catch up than the readers because, yes, Mike Baird might tweet about The Bachelor, but if he's mm. got a policy announcement, he's still going to drop it to the telly. Yeah. And um, there is a view amongst lots of staffers that, you know, newspaper is where it's at. And I thought it was hilarious um, after the spill that in the Media Watch segment, you know, um, they were musing that perhaps this is the beginning of the end of the power of the shock jocks. It's like, mate, that ship sailed years ago. Um, <laughs> they might have power over a certain number of politicians, mm. but they have no, no actual influence. And those politicians are the ones who actually haven't worked it out yet. Mm. Mm. One of the other big changes I noticed, having put this session together over many years, is that we used to struggle to have a woman on stage, apart from myself and sharing it, of course, which is a privilege <laughs> I always claim for myself. And it was usually the ABC we looked to for that. And now, in fact, the new media entrants tend or are more likely to be female-dominated. Do you think this is a change, Emily and Tori? I don't think they're female-dominated. I think mm. that's overstating. female That's a little bit I exci said. excitable. I, you know, that mm. we're, we're not the only new entrants in the market. The, the male is here. Mm. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole host of other sm smaller news sites like Business Insider and... BBC, mm. I'd say, Tabor. yeah, I, w I would think it was fair to say that their News Corp um, graduate dominated because mm. it seems to be the hunting ground for editors but um, look I certainly I think it's easier for women to get in uh, to more senior roles in digital media but I wouldn't say it's shifted we have significantly. A lot of, yeah we have a lot of women uh, working for us uh, by far a majority of my newsroom is, is women and m many of our most senior people are as well and mm. our, that actually reflects our audience our audience mm. is you know uh, 65 to 70 percent female mm. um much you know and and our content is very sort of focused on, on, on um you know appealing to you know um we talk a lot about issues relating to feminism and stuff and that's like a big driver of our audience's interests mm. Yes, and Emily, do you think this is a, a big change or not? I think it's a good thing. Uh, mm. I, uh, th now, that all the three main editions of The Guardian are edited by women, and we, we, feel, we really feel it. It makes a huge mm. difference. And one small, one small but trivial example is that I was going to do a thing here about endometriosis, and I'm, I mentioned it in a kind of long, winding note to my boss. And she immediately said, I think that's a bad idea I want you to do it globally completely differently get all the officers involved do it really big mm. and it could be that a male boss would have said that but I'm not no, sure really so. that and they that would have been and I'm not amazing. sure I would have mentioned it and <laughs> said it was something about ladies bits in a kind mm. of long note to my boss and it turned into a huge thing we got thousands of women writing to us and doctors all around the world it was it was a really great thing anyway Maybe in a really male-dominated world and industry, putting women into all the top jobs is a good corrective. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Now, sticking with you, Emily, when I said what's your main gripe about the Australian media, you ever so tactfully it's said that joke. you didn't really have any because if other people are rubbish, that's just great for us. Um, are, are other people rubbish and what is no, the nature no, of their no, rubbishness? No, they're not. They're not. It's, it's, it feels, so it's bad it for feels you. Like a good, it feels to me like a good time, good competition... Lots of excitement, things like Simon putting his man Mark Di Stefano into Canberra. It's good fun. It keeps everyone on their toes. Mm. It feels like maybe a year ago we would chase stories on our own and now there's a group of us doing it and that's a good thing when it's things like refugees. and um, I don't have a go. I love it. I love it all. Mm. I like the hurly-burly of it. And I, 
it's a bit upsetting, some of it, and some of it I consider, you know, there's columnists here who seem to be misogynistic and mm -hmm. Islamophobic, and I'm not sure they'd be allowed to say it by law, some of the stuff they say in the UK, but... I think you touched on at the beginning how exciting it is. I, I first came in as a backpacker, worked for the Sydney Morning Herald, and it really was just Fairfax and News, as you pointed out. Mm. And I think the switch now to, in the last four or five years, how there's so many digital players. I think if you're a young person reading news in Australia, it's a very exciting time. There's so many different ways you can take um, look at look at what's happening and so many different angles to look mm -hmm. at. So I think it's a really exciting time for a consumer, and that makes it a really exciting time to be a journalist. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you said that interested me in terms of challenges, you said uh, that BuzzFeed moving into the Canberra Press Gallery, that you were a Canberra virgin That's as right. a publication, and all the rules were changing. You also said that one of the challenges for the year ahead was to do more real-world reporting. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, that's a, I mean, BuzzFeed is very much, uh, you know, all our reporters have grown up with the internet, don't really remember well before the internet, don't really, didn't learn how to be journalists by going and doing death knocks and knocking on doors and digging around in documents and libraries and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and, and going to courts. A lot of them haven't spent a lot of time in courts. So I I'm really think we're doing a brilliant job on the internet, and I think that, like, we think certainly that the internet is a place where news breaks, where news happens, where somebody who's mouthing off is just the equivalent of somebody who would have been standing in Federation mm. Square or on Martin Place. And so it's actually the real world. We don't see that much of a division. And we, mm. I think, do a very good job of reporting what goes on there. But certainly there are stories that happen beyond the internet. And, and we've invested quite a lot this year in some reporters who are getting out of the cities, who are going uh, very regional and remote and looking mm. for stories. And I want to do much more of that and, and also spend time you know, um, investing in journalism where people are not focused on the day or the week or even the month, but on a long piece of investigative work that will sort of reap the benefit down the line. And what's it like being a virgin in the Canberra Press Gallery, which is surely <laughs> one of the biggest clubs of inside? It was pretty... F I mean, we, Mark and I went uh, at, in February uh, and had plans it out through the long summer break, got down there and there was a spill the first day we got there. So that was pretty exciting to be there on, on the first day um, mm. when there was the first spill. And, you know, we, we went to the budget and we had a lot of fun there. And so we're learning as we go. And um, certainly I think there's some people who really think that arrivals and new arrivals and The Guardian were there a year before us and mm. I think have gone through some of the kind of issues where um, it's a kind of it's an they old They wouldn't give club. us an office. Yeah, they didn't give an office and, <laughs> and now we've been shunted around looking for a gallery, an office in the press gallery. And, you mm. know, the, you know the, the, there's definitely kind of um, a, a, a sense incumbency and people have been there doing things for a long time and we're shaking up and I think that's a good and an invigorating thing and an invigorating thing for the press gallery as well mm -hmm. and we don't you know we're, we're hiring a Canberra reporter we definitely want to be there but also I think an advantage that we have is to be a bit outsidery and you know you know I sort of I, I grew up with private eye the sort of satirical news um, mm -hmm. um, a newspaper in the UK and I think that, that approach of, of kind of like taking the piss being irreverent um, ripping in having yeah. fun with politics it actually makes it very engaging for young people is this very different from what you would do Andrew having fun with politics listicles out of the budget <clears throat> no I don't think so I mean I you know you look at Tony Wright Tony Wright's been having fun with politicians for, mm. for many many years and that's mm. precisely what he's there but you know we'll still package it around the, you know the more earnest straight reportage if you want um, which certainly a lot of our readers uh, would expect of us. I mean, I think the, the fantastic thing about what's happening in the journalism and why it arguably is a really exciting time mm. is that if all you had was the two traditional media staring at the abyss of the digital world and the collapse of it and, and looking to each other for ways of how to get through it and, and learn the new ways of storytelling, which is basically what we're talking about, then we would fail. We'd, we'd stumble around in the dark and we wouldn't have the faintest idea. The beauty of having these guys is they're experimenting and they don't have this great burden of, oh, you're the age 160 years or the Sydney Morning Herald, you have to do it this way, or the ABC, you've got to do it precisely this way because of your charter. They can go and break all the rules and have some fun and do some different things and we can watch mm. that and learn from that and realise, you know, there are different ways of telling stories and we're entitled to do that. Mm. So it's not such an intrusion, these overseas upstarts. And it's still the principles of journalism because... Mm. You know, I had a, our, our youngest associate turned up to stand up the other afternoon and we said, what do you do? What have you been doing? And he said, oh, oh I've just done a Skype interview with a um, Syrian bloke who's been holed up with his family in um, Lebanon for 18 months waiting to hear back from the Australian government on his visa application. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what? <laughs> and a woman had tweeted at Mike Baird after Mike Baird's big sort of Facebook outburst, mm. that tweet had gone unreplied to, so Josh replied to her and she put him in contact and he got this amazing story and he then had to set about doing all the 
traditional journalistic things of verifying the story and checking it and doing the, the interview and checking everything with the government. So he did old school journalism, but he wouldn't have got that story unless he was um, a digital native. Mm. Mm. He'd grown up with understanding that that's the way people operate. I, mm. I, by the way, I think the term digital native, I completely mm. just, I just think it's, I think it's just, it's just, it's just nonsense that you can, any intelligent person mm. can go and live on the internet and be happy there and be at home. No, and, but it means and, and like anyone, like it's not like, but Twitter isn't really hard, is it? You don't need to have grown up with Twitter to, to see someone tweeting no. and contact them. And I, I'm just sorry, but I, I yeah. People well, always talk about digital just, natives, yeah, I'm not, not sure any meant, such thing exists, yeah, but the way yeah. other people use it. Yeah, okay. Mm. Well, that's not what I meant. I yeah. meant people who, like, that's the only way they've ever yeah. performed their journalism. People and it's not, you know, it's, it's changed. You know, I only did my cadetship 15 years ago, and I knocked on more people's doors to, you know, ask them about their 17-year-old that's been killed in a car crash than I've had hot dinners. And, you know, that's a very different way of getting stories. Mm. And that's not that long ago. Yeah. Just sticking with you, Tori, um, yeah. you said in your challenges, yeah. listicle, um, that um, finding an Australian voice for mm. the Huffington Post was important to you and one of your main challenges. Yes. And interestingly, Emily said that the challenge was breaking down geographical barriers and writing more for The Guardian's international presence because geography is irrelevant. Yeah. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like yeah. to hear more from each of you on those things and then perhaps get Andrew and Simon to chime in. Tori, would you like to start? What does an Australian voice mean for an oh, international look, media brand? Well, that's the daily question, isn't it? Mm. I mean, we're eight weeks old. Huffington Post is 10 years old. You haven't old. worked it out yet? Five years ago, <laughs> Huffington Post had 40 staff. Mm. There's nearly 900 of them now and we're the 15th at launch edition. And by definition of language, the international editions are all very different. Um, just before we launched, the Arabic version launched out of Istanbul. Mm. So, you know, they have a slightly different look mm. and feel. And the Huffington Post already has a very strong brand here and a lot of um, Australians already going to it. So obviously we can't just turn it on its head and pretend it's something else. But we could never expect to come into this market and just sort of look and feel exactly the same as the US side. So mm. I... I don't even want to define what our Australian voice is compared to the US site yet because it's just, it's, it's too soon. But you can tell by looking at it that we have a slightly different feel. I think we are slightly more featurey in our splash treatments. Um, they go, f um, I would say, 80% of their splashes are straight politics. Mm. That's not, we don't do 80% straight politics here. Um, and that's partly because of the size of our market, like, you know, there's not that much political news that's interesting that's <laughs> going to keep us going for 80% of our splashes. Mm. Mm. And Emily, geography is irrelevant? No, but, but I think we're talking about a few different things here. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how the front of our, um, how our homepage looks here, the, the Australian readers want slightly different stuff from UK readers and American readers. Here, a, a Guardian reader in Australia has a thirst for heavy stuff, economics, politics, and it's the kind of lighter stuff that does well in the UK actually doesn't often do that well here. Food does well, fashion does badly. So, so there is that difference, but that's more about the readers than us. Yep. And the second thing is a culture thing. And one of my colleagues came from the New York Times, Aaron Pilhofer, and he said at the, at the New York Times, and there's a big project, someone says, I'm not sure that's very Timesian. The project's dead. And it's dead even if it took nine months. Mm. And at The Guardian, we, we also have a thing about it. It's not quite strong. We'll go, oh, I'm not sure that's very Guardian. Mm. And then we might debate it. We'll at least debate it then. But often, it not being very Guardian, we'll kill it. And what we mean by that is a sort of, sort of deep sense of, sort of culture, values, conduct, mission, mm. practices. Mm. Um, it's not like the Moonies, but it is. that's a strong sense of that. And so we have that exact Guardian sense here. All of our 42 full-time people are Guardian, like, right to their boots. Mm. The voice thing is because everyone who's allowed to write on the site is an Australian, and they're given enormous freedom to say what they like. So all our columnists, all our reporters are Australian. Mm. I think this is one of the challenges mm. that, that when we all face the international rivals is taking the global brand and making it into a uniquely Australian voice. And that was certainly the remit that I was given at the beginning was, you know, try and f figure that out. And we're like a kind of laboratory approach. Like, you know, we spent the last 18 months, I think we kind of cracked it with kind of our buzz stuff, which mm. is 
our core kind of, um, you know, the fun stuff, the list, the quizzes, and that's about identity and people's sense of identity and their sense of Australian identity. And that gave us a thing to build on with news because we discovered the things that people were really passionate about because we experimented with the fun stuff. And I think that, like, you know, we're still figuring it out. I wouldn't say, I think, you know, um, you know, I, it's, it's not something that you'll crack right at the beginning, of course not. Mm. And I think that like, we certainly feel that BuzzFeed is a brand that's a global brand that we want to echo, but that also, you know, we also want to imagine that our BuzzFeed Australian brand, our BuzzFeed Oz brand is unique, and that's something you know, that people around the world will think, oh, that's, I want to see what their treatment on, on this, this Australian story is. Yeah. And so like, injecting ourselves into the cultural conversation and feeling like people want to go and see like, the way that they go to see The Guardian and The Age and The Half Po, like, what, mm. what are they going to, th- how have BuzzFeed Oz treated this? Mm. So, yeah, it's exciting to figure it out. And Andrew, for you, I guess the version of this question would be The Age is a Melbourne and a Victorian newspaper, but it n- is now part of Fairfax, which is Sydney, dominated from Sydney and run from Sydney, sharing an increasing amount of content across the uh, Fairfax papers nationwide and websites as well. Is, is geography still a thing? Is it still possible to be a Melbourne paper? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, Fairfax has owned us since 1985 or thereabouts, so we've been within that mm. Sydney sphere for quite some time, so we're pretty used to it. Um, and your localised stories still make the difference, but that can be something like um, the AFL being such a predominant football code here and a, and a mm. core part of our success. Um, and then it's picking up on the, on the stories that matter to your population here. But by the same token, you flick it to that national thing. So Adele Ferguson's work on 7-Eleven is a national story. It's not purely a Victorian story, although um, in many respects that's where it began. So um, we, I, I think we can mix both. I think what, what's really fascinating for us is there's a clear sense in our audience of what the age stands for, the value set that it works with in terms of our journalism, the ethics that underpins that. We've been very earnest as well, though. Um, We've done a whole lot of stories that sort of meet the cod liver oil thing that, you know, we're going to make you read this because it's good for you. It might be boring and you may not really care about it, but you have to read it. Um, Or we could in print because we made the choice what went into print and, you know, and that was it and that was all you got to choose. The digital world, of course, tells you very quickly whether anybody cares about that story. And there may be some intrinsic value, but you're going to have to figure out a different way of telling it to to explain to people why they should care about that story. And I think that's the fascinating challenge for newsrooms like The Age, is you can have, you, you can enjoy the heritage and the, and the power that that heritage gives you, the credibility, um, but it's not everything. You, you, you can't let go of the fundamentals of the journalism. You've still got to get out there and, and make it interesting to your reader and make them want to read it. Mm. But, but my question to you would be, we, if we're finding that there are loads of, re- however many millions of readers who want really, really serious stuff. Like the most sort of car clickbait is Greg Jericho writing about superannuation or Lenore Taylor writing about the TPP or carbon policy. And it, they go mad for it. So what, like bright red hot, it's, it is amazing. Uh, so why isn't what you call your more earnest stuff doing well on the web? But it does. Okay. Seven Eleven rates as well as any yeah. other story that we might publish. Yeah. Any well, of those major sorry, investigations I... do. So I mean, the you know your fundamental journalism that, yeah. that can change the the national agenda, yeah. that still rates. That still matters. The the challenge is picking up something, for example, like the crime stats that came out last week, okay. and you and you lob up a boring statistical story, and nobody's going to read it. And in fact, the online editor said to the person, you know. Actually, I'm not interested in that. If all you're going to tell me is crime's up 4% and this is 8%, nobody cares. They've read that story before, even if the figures change slightly. You need to go away and find a way of telling that story that makes me want to keep going. Mm. Well, before we get on to all the stories that you've all done brilliantly, and I'm sure you'll all be very happy to tell me about that, with all this excitement, all this newness, where is the media failing over the last year? What stories haven't got the attention that they should have? What has the media not been able to cover, and I've got a few ideas if you can't come up with some. Oh. <laughs> we just don't have enough reporters to do as much as we want to do. What would but you we have do? To say, if we need more money, then we can have more reporters. And then, but I mean, What would next be next on your list, Emily, if uh, you had an extra two? I know, just an extra ten for now would all be <laughs> all I'm asking for. And also, th- also, there's about four billion people who are kind of on our watch time zone wise, because as well as doing news for Australia, we also do we're also like the, we mm. do news for the whole world when America and England are sleeping. So we've got about four billion people on our patch outside Australia and about mm. six reporters. And so 
it seems to me there's enormous opportunity in the in the general region. So what are you region. missing? What are you missing because of your lack of reporters? Uh, an Indonesia reporter, someone mm. in New Zealand, mm. uh, more people in China, people in Hong Kong, uh, Indonesia, mm. that that mm. kind of thing. And looking more broadly oh, beyond, just oh, here. beyond your own organisation, oh, what, what just, stories? It's just all our reporters are juggling breaking news with their own investigations. Mm. But and the projects. media generally in Australia, what are you missing? What's the media missing? What oh. are the stories that aren't getting the attention they deserve? And surely you're not going to tell me there aren't any. Uh, look, there's an, there is an issue that's my kind of bugbear that I think is massively underreported, and it's because it's not a breaking news story, and it's the shape of the Australian workforce and how people are expected to build a future mm -hmm. in the economy in the way that it's structured, mm -hmm. and how they're supposed to build a future for their children, how they're supposed to have any certainty. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that the way the economy has gone is the wrong way. Um, I'm not saying we need to change the economy, but mm. I think we need to examine what our society is going to look like over the next 30 or 40 years with, you know, more people on short-term contracts, mm. more people um, not necessarily having the security that they used to have. And as I said, I'm not opposed to that, but I don't think we're talking about how we're going to deal with that mm. as a yeah, nation. I would definitely agree. But and one of the things that's been really going well for us is surprisingly for our young audience is penalty rates. Yeah. Like, People are obsessive about it. It goes mega viral yeah. every time, and it's like a really surprising. And thing. I agree that's a really good topic, but mm. structurally, like yeah, that, well like that, that is, you yeah. know, it, it, that affects people's paychecks. But mm. what about their ability to plan? Mm. Yeah. And I, like, we just don't. It's a, it's a hard thing to get into because how do you cover it? As I said, it's not a breaking news story. You can't dig up exclusives about how people feel about their jobs and their security. Mm. But I think it's something. It's the, it's the one issue that affects every single Australian. Um, much more than migration or um, any of the things that our political coverage likes to focus on. Mm. And yet, no, I don't think anyone's worked out a way to cover it in a long-term, meaningful way. Mm. Any other topics? Would you like to nominate anything we're I, not doing? I right? think we're, we remain handicapped by a lack of diversity, so I don't think we've really reported what's happening within Muslim communities and how they feel by what's happened in the past 12 months. I don't think we... Um, accurately portray what's happening amongst the, the Chinese student communities. We find it difficult to get in there and talk to them and find out what's really occurring and because we don't have those sort of reporters within our newsrooms mm. who've grown up with the nature of journalism as we understand it but the ability to talk to those communities and represent them, I think we struggle on that. So too often when we see a community, a small community under stress, it comes as a bit of a surprise to us too often. Mm. And Simon? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm actually very jealous and, and use um, The Guardian and Emily as an example a lot of the time with my pitch for a kind of more resource because The Guardian have reporters in Darwin and in one. Brisbane. Well, one, one. More than us. And in Brisbane <laughs> and in one. Perth. And, one. and they have a team one in there. Melbourne. With all these things are more than BuzzFeed. And so they also have like a great immigration reporter and they have one. a data yeah. team and they have all these things. One so, person in the data team. Uh, all the, but all one yeah. more than us. So uh, this is a great thing that I use to sort of say, well, look, yeah. um, if we're wanting to compete with a site like The Guardian, yeah. we should have these people. And I certainly think immigration is still, of course, not a, a thing that's not going to go away. It's an issue that's going to be there. Um, and I definitely echo what Andrew says about diversity. And the thing we've tried to do and what we're doing internationally is very, very focused on diversity in terms of who we employ and how we report. So we're very focused on race, identity. In Australia, we've, um, you know, we've got a reporter doing gender and we've got a reporter doing Indigenous affairs and a reporter doing um, LGBT. And I think that that was a way that we realised after the first sort of six months, these are things that our audience really, really care about. Mm -hmm. Let's, we're not going to be able to compete on hard news, on straight news, on, on um, you know, transport, education, those things with big, big resource mm -hmm. newsrooms at Fairfax mm -hmm. News and the ABC. But we can add one reporter who can really make a difference reporting some of those issues. And so I think we'll, we'll look to kind of expand in that way. Do Australians understand the budget? Is this Canberra Virgin? Did you manage to explain it to them? I think we managed to explain it in a list, yeah. And um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, our there's guys came out... nothing revolutionary about that, though. I'm sorry. The yeah, no, no, have list, been doing list, that for nothing, centuries. Yeah, the lists have been around since the Ten Commandments, haven't they? So they're not that new. But, we, you know, yeah, we, I, I think um, certainly uh, the challenge of that for us was um, getting in there and coming out with something and coming out fast out of the blocks. And so we came out with a whole load of... Um, tweets ready to drop and that's how kind of we reported it and we didn't focus too much on getting articles up straight to the way although we got a dozen up within the first hour mm -hmm. we were very focused on explaining it through so through the through dropping things on facebook and dropping things on twitter and that's where our reporting was 
Mm. They understand it in an emotional mm. way, even if they can't tell you the detail. Mm. I mean, they knew very quickly, and it wasn't because the media told them to think this, that last year's budget was intrinsically unfair. Mm. And that's what trashed the government's popularity. That, that's what led to the end of Tony Abbott, is they got it. They knew that budget mm. was not a good budget and was not a fair budget. And they may not have been able to, to articulate the specifics as to why that was, but it, it was certainly there. And budget night coverage is... I think there's too much focus on what the budget night coverage is. Oh, who won with that tweet? Who, like, mm. the, the stories of the budget always take a few days mm. to come out mm. um, because the story of budget night is what the government says it is and then what some people locked in a room decide it is. But it always, as you know, I think it took the whole community a couple of days to get their heads around what there happened is, in 2014. There is no more absurd exercise within our community than budget day. Mm. Locking up hundreds of yeah. people in a room. They should just put it all online at midday and... From, what is it, one or two o'clock? I mean, yeah. why don't they open up at six o'clock in the morning? I mean, who cares how long yeah. it takes you to read the budget document? No, no, it's got to be this defined period and you all march in and you all go crazy and you all go and steal lollies from everybody else's tray if you possibly can. Yeah, I mean, fun. it's just, it's complete and utter madness. <laughs> and people write stories about around. the lock-up, like people give a oh, shit no, about it's that. Just, <laughs> it's just complete nonsense. Yeah. Now, what, one thing that I think most of you, and perhaps not all of you, mentioned as a challenge is a raft of government legislation which impinges in various ways on freedom of the media, ability to protect sources with metadata legislation and so on. Can you talk a bit about that, Andrew, what the legislation is and how it presents a Well, there's challenge? been a range. I mean, the metadata is an interesting one because they say that um, there's an exclusion for journalists and journalists won't be targeted, i.e. they won't call up my mobile phone and see whether they can gauge any information from that. But that actually isn't the point. They can have a look at mine and target any mobile phone from anybody in the Department of Budget or Finance and see whether they've gone anywhere near me and find out pretty clearly what my source is. So they can, they can pick on the public servant and narrow that down and have a pretty good idea of who might have been the whistleblower that, that might have met me. So that's the, that's the potential danger, is it, is it has a way of exposing the whistleblower and making it difficult for the journalist um, to have that confidence when they say to somebody, I, I won't reveal who you are, I'll protect you, but that person saying, but that might not be enough. There's other ways that they can identify me. So that, that's a very chilling one. And your report it was so extreme with the last government. It'd be really interesting to see. It was so regressive, so repressive. It would be mm. really interesting to see what Turnbull does and whether he starts to row back from such aggressive chasing of whistleblowers and... Mm. Politicians Don't hate undoing legislation. Yeah, they do, and I think it's actually a global story, isn't it? And I think mm. we're, we're obviously in the, seeing the Guardian mm. the fact yeah. that Snowden's um, holed up in an undemocratic company on Twitter. Where he, on Twitter, where he can't speak his voice. <laughs> Assange is, in, is locked up in the Ecuadorian embassy. All these people are um, com very, very feel like the internet. I guess technology has uh, given our governments uh, an, an unprecedented ability to poke into our lives. And, um, and poke into the lives of journalists and to monitor what we do. And so, yeah, it's, it mm. feels like, um, you know, the playing field is, is certainly immensely more complex and immensely more difficult. Mm. Okay. Now, going back three years ago, we were talking about paywalls. News Corporation was about to start them. Fairfax, I think, had already started at the Australian Financial Review and has since introduced them. And there were various views on this. Some said it was going to be the great saviour of the business, that everybody would be reading on iPads and everybody would be happy to pay realistic prices for reading news. Nobody's saying that anymore, are they? Uh, the Guardian at the moment is still free, I think, although the app, I think I'm correct, if you download the app, you have to pay something for it in England? No, I think we have England? a premium service where you can get it without the It's very hard yeah. to give the Guardian. Yeah. Except now with ad blockers, it's yeah. completely not Huffington Post is free, BuzzFeed is free, your content is behind a paywall. Is all, it working? All, all parts of it. Well, I mean, is it working? It, it makes us $20 million a year that we didn't have three years ago. Mm. That's does, pretty helpful. Yeah. Does it cut I'm you happy out with that. The, does it cut you out of the conversation? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, it was we, we looked at the New York Times. We looked a lot, obviously, and we, we followed the New York Times model. So it's deliberately porous. You can get around it mm. pretty easily if you want to. I mean, but, you know, look, it, it's been a, a pretty handy source of revenue, and, but it's not growing. So it's not the, it's not the saviour. It's not going to suddenly make 200 or $500 million mm. and replace the classifiers that we used to have in print. It's a component of it. Mm. Um, and how we change that, whether we develop it 
you know, there's lots of debates in there. So it's not, it was never going to be a, the, the silver bullet, to be honest. Is there a saviour, though? Is there a silver bullet? No, I don't think so, unless you've got either a trust that means that you can lose money and still stay alive, or um, <laughs> you have a very wealthy owner who lets you go dancing around the world doing all that you like. So well, I, they're probably the answers. Who's that? Is that, that? you? I, was <laughs> <laughs> I, think Ari I think Ariana would be a lovely... Uh, oh, right. Sorry, I, was I was about to turn to oh. Emily, Rupert, for that because matter. Emily was reminding us in the green room just no, a moment ago. No, no, privately. Yeah. <laughs> Or what? something she said publicly last year, which I would therefore won't repeat if yeah. it's going to be embarrassing. But um, is the Guardian making Twitter. money, Emily? Well, we make money, but also we spend money. <laughs> 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 so we make it, we spend it. Who would have thought? We make more, we spend more. <laughs> um, is there a plan for the oh, Guardian? Oh, but we're different here. So we're actually, the Guardian Australia is a completely different model from mm. Guardian Global. We're sort of a... a t uh, completely different thing. We're an Australian company and mm. we had a, we're wholly owned by Guardian Global with one investor. We get no money from Guardian Global and we have to, as we go through our investment, we have to make money and we hope to become self-sustaining here, year five or six. Guardian Globally lives off this quite large trust fund, charitable trust fund. Mm. And is there a plan to, for the global presence to also but yeah, so they, they do all kinds of things. Clay Shirky came into The Guardian about, who's obviously a digital guru, came into The Guardian about three years ago and he said, this is just a, an apocalyptic 10 years and everyone needs to just do everything they can to get whatever money they can to get to the end of the 10 years and then not all of us will be standing, but some people will. Mm. And that's about three years ago he said that. It sounded true at the time and I think it's even truer mm. now. Mm. Now, Simon, you've talked about um, the worthy reporting you're doing, Canberra, Indigenous reporters, all the rest of it, but it's it's um, cats as well, isn't it? And and it's certainly that, that's and the, yeah, that's the engine room for is us. Is this a sustainable business model, supporting a bit of worthy with a lot of entertainment? Well, I mean, we think so. Certainly, the fact that like um, I've looked in recent days in the UK, the Tory conference is on. We have an investigation t investigative team that went in that we um, invested in at the start of this year, and most of them haven't published a thing all year. And a, a report with six bylines was published, and, and mm. a number of um, reports in the last few days about a major donor to the Conservative Party who's been siphoning money around big, huge, millions and millions of pounds in cash. And I think that that work would only have been enabled and allowed um, with the money that we've made, you know, doing funny lists about middle class problems in England or like things that Scottish people like battering their um, deep fried Mars bars in and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, um, certainly uh, investigations is something we'd love to do here. And I think that um, those things can only be paid for by revenue, by, um, you know, other parts of the business and we're very focused yes on those things video is a, a massive thing for us that's exploded in LA from you know a year and a half ago we had no one and now we have a hundred people making videos in LA we have people in Australia making videos and um, that's you know we talked about uh, Facebook as this uh, for us it's a distributor but other social networks are very important to us as well um, and so we're very focused on uh, these revenue opportunities, because they will be the things, the fun things, will a lot of the time be the things that fund our journalism. And are you in the black in Australia? Are you making money? I'm not allowed to talk about our finances, <laughs> no. But you don't, you don't make much money anyway, do you? I mean, what's your annual income? No, I think they do. I think you do, and I think, yeah. I think you do, don't you? Yeah, but <laughs> I feel like they because the journalists are like, oh, I don't know. Some <laughs> hundreds of jobs all around the world. Yeah, we're definitely yeah. making money, and and um, our revenue is, you know, is turning over and growing very mm. significantly. And we're very young, like we're competing with old, old businesses, like all of us, like um, Huffington Post are a little bit older than us, but um, our founder was a founder of the Huffington Post as well. And, uh, you know, this, I feel that uh, we're uh, in a very exciting time. I always say this, a very exciting time for journalism. There's a big transition. There's companies like us, Vice and Vox, which have all had massive investments in the last six months, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars going in because uh, our audience is in the social space, on phones, and uh, we feel that we're very well placed. But we also are trying to do the serious stuff mm. as well, and I think that that's really important. And but isn't that exactly what media companies have been doing forever, using content that is popular to make money to pay for journalism? Yes, I'm not that's suggesting, pretty much it's, not suggesting what it's what media companies do, isn't mm. it? Now, eight weeks in, I guess you're not in the black yet. Is there a plan? I don't know. Well, of course there's a plan, but that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> my job is to look at it. Seriously, my, we have a CEO who mm. has a very comprehensive How long plan. have you got to make to get it into the black in Australia? I don't know. 
You don't know? You haven't oh, seriously, I don't know. No. Ask Chris Jans. What a wonderful place yeah. to be in. Eh? What a wonderful <laughs> place to be in. I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of absurdity to it in, in terms of the way um, the business community thinks of it, but, but they're getting the future. So at the moment, if I make $10 of EBITDA from print, so $10 of profit from print at the moment, um, in the share market's view, that's only worth as much as $1 <laughs> from digital. Yeah. So I'm getting $10 of cash right now, but that's only worth as much as $1 of the future. Because we know what's happening. The big pot for print is contracting, and the pot's moving to digital. So if we don't get how to make money like these guys mm. do in digital, we won't be around in 10 years' time. So yes. those companies that, that think that they can survive by sticking their head in the print sand Mm. are going to find that the pot will boil and it won't be a very comfortable place to be. Now, we've got about four minutes left before I want to throw to questions. I just want to ask you each to talk very briefly about the year ahead. What frightens you about it? What excites you about it? And if you can manage to squeeze in a word about all the things you've done wonderfully, I will let you at this end of the conversation, <laughs> whereas I've tried to keep you a rein on that. Simon, do you want to kick off? Well, I'm excited to continue our expansion by... A, a particularly in the distributed uh, sphere. We're, so we've had a very exciting year on Facebook. Our audience has really exploded there, as Andrew said. That's where 13 million Australians are a day. Um, you know, it's not necessarily tracked by Nielsen, but that's where our audience really is. And uh, I think we have a bigger Facebook audience in Australia than uh, the other three publishers here combined. So we want to grow that. But also we want to focus very much on Snapchat, on Instagram, on Vine, and adding, um, you know, finding new ways to reach people through those other social networks. And then we want to add hard reporting in as well. And we want to expand our hard reporting and add in reporters, you know, covering immigration and covering all sorts of things that we're not yet covering. And what frightens you? Um, I, th I think I said uh, the love media is the thing that frightens me. So this accusation that because we tell stories positively that that's somehow a bad thing. This is so coming I, yeah, from so the... Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that like the culture wars will maybe kind of ease now that we have Malcolm Turnbull a little bit. Um, uh, but certainly like th that sense of um, this kind of internal warfare that I only think journalists care about and the public don't care about, mm. um, that kind of frightens me that that will carry on and I hope it stops. Yeah. Emily? Uh, just to disagree with you slightly, our readers are nuts about Andrew Bolt having a row with, with Chris Mitchell. At the, they love it. They're really into the culture war. So it isn't just journalist on journalist action. People are addicted to the, the most ugly sides of it. Anyway. Um, That's your uh, left wing people enjoying the right wing nut jobs tearing themselves <laughs> apart. That's yeah, what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I didn't say that, but yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. Uh, so, so things that I've got to do this year. Um, to do a lot more live. I know everybody's doing a lot more live, but um, we've just sort of made little forays. First Dog on the Moon, our cartoonist, has, got, has developed a, sh a show, which is brilliant. Uh, and we've started going into festivals and doing more of that, and we need to do more of that. And that's a big to-do this year. And frightened? Your fears? Uh, I'm, I, like, I'm just... Uh, that I, what is the opposite of paranoia? I, um, I have pro. I suffer from pronoia. I always think people <laughs> like me a bit more than they do, and it will all yeah, be so lovely. Rainbows and great. unicorns. <laughs> Excellent, Tori. Ad, uh, ad blockers actually worries me, and ad blockers, all the kind of okay. big seismic digital shifts, mm -hmm. and, and and ultimately making mm -hmm. loads of money and all that. But yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. apart from that. Um, so uh, our focus needs to be pretty quickly bedding down from launch because obviously eight weeks is not a very long time. And most of the team, myself included, started about two and a half weeks before we launched. Mm. Um, so we were still learning the content management system live mm -hmm. and that was really fun. But so I'm sort of focused on trying to get a bit more structure in place and a bit more planning. Mm. And that's actually happening quicker than I, my ambition for it which is really reassuring because the team, they're amazing and they've all taken to it a lot quicker than anyone would have anticipated. Um, another focus is going to be um, learning exactly what the resources of Huffington Post Global are and what's available to us and how we can use it because five years ago Huffington Post was 40 people and now it's nearly 900 people and there's an enormous amount of amazing journalism going on and some of it goes on without any of us knowing because it's... It's so huge and um, I want to make sure that every single bit of excellent journalism that's in at all way relevant or interesting to Australian readers 
is made available to them. So that's quite a big focus for me. And as for being frightened, I'm not frightened of anything. Like, bring it on. And I actually, I also don't care what anyone else is doing. Okay. Like, I really am not... Like, I just don't pay that much attention. I pay attention to great content, and I love it when I see great stories. And when I saw your endometriosis package, I thought that was amazing. And I see what you guys are doing, and I think it's great. And people at Fairfax are doing incredible things, and I love that. But to anything else, I don't really pay much attention. Fearless, all of Too you. Too busy. Andrew, are you fearless? <laughs> Um, I'll do the excited bit, okay, I'll do the, <laughs> the glass half full bit first. Um, I'm always excited by the fact that this country has a never-ending resource of scumbags, dirty um, <laughs> public officials, business people rorting somebody else. So, what a great um, way to look at it. It's, it's, I lived in New Zealand for 10 years, let me tell you, this place is God-given to journalists. <laughs> Um, so that's exciting, and, and you know, and I'm, and I'm blessed to have a newsroom with some extraordinary people like Adele and Nick and Richard and um, Caro and Jake Nile. So I know they'll do fantastic stuff. That'll be wonderful. Um, frightened? I probably should be frightened by the sheer fact that I've been in the gig just over three years now, and the average lifespan these days of an age editor is four years. Um, so I might be chatting with these guys pretty soon. <laughs> No wonder you're being well, so I, nice. That's right. In the long term, what frightens me, I, the, the journalists um, developed or innate uh, lack of trust. I just watch, watch Facebook and what they're doing with news and I look at Google and what they do with their algorithms and I look at Apple and I don't trust any of them. Yeah, thanks guys. My name's Chris. I'm a musician. Um, and I appreciate all you guys turning up. And to the age... Um, guy from um, the age um, with Adele, Nick and Caro uh, pass on my best regards to them like they're really good writers they're uh, you know, top notch, top shelf so hat tip to them um, a question is um, a while ago on Facebook a Melbourne writer, Sean M. Whelan he's a writer and a p poet um, highlighted the Saturday paper and from his post I've been getting the Saturday paper every Saturday uh, my question to the panel is, what are your thoughts on the quality of journalism of the Saturday paper and does it have any influence on journalism in Melbourne? I think it's got influence on journalism in Australia. I think it's been very refreshing. I think most people probably thought that they were insane to try and launch a newspaper and I think it's been a, a wonderful success um, and I think some of their, the fact that they're very focused on like long pieces of reporting and they've done amazing work on uh, Nauru and Manau and I think you know, I think uh, it's, it's great that there's a newspaper and I certainly subscribe to it and I, I know a lot of people who do, so I think it's a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. Emily? I, I, uh, I don't think it's interesting at all that it's a newspaper. I mean, whatever. I, th they do great journalism, yeah. which is yeah. the important thing and it's good and Eric's great. I don't have a strong opinion on it. Like, I, you know, I've, I read it sometimes, sometimes I don't. I don't think it's, had a, I don't think it's changed anything. Yeah, it's, look, it's an outlet. You know, any outlet for journalism is good, um, and we like the fact that we print it, so we make some money off it. So <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Alex West. Um, I'm on the more visual end of things. My traditional things in television and factual television and documentaries and so on. It was really interesting to hear what um, Simon and Andrew and Emily talked about the creation like um, um, Dog on the Moon as a show and the uh, penetration into more visual content. I know plenty of people now shooting for, for Vice and, and you guys and so on. And, and uh, Andrew talked about new ways of storytelling, new forms, new modes. Um, are we seeing a kind of complete melting between television and news media in the sense of the print media? I think one of the biggest mistakes online media companies can make is to think that you can just put television on the internet and that that will work. And that's what most of them are doing. So an enormous number of online videos are journalists interviewing journalists or blokes in suits staring at the camera doing their analysis of the day and it's just, I don't, they're mad. They're, like, they're just throwing their money down the internet pit. Um, so I think... Um, the, the companies that are doing it well, like BuzzFeed, um, are, it bears no resemblance to television and it's not consumed in the way that television is consumed and I think every, every online media company should just be doing things that are completely 100% um, mobile focused. Um, 
that's how people consume their video. I know it's how I consume most of my video on my phone. And that, you know, you can't, you don't watch TV on your phone, you watch a totally different product. But the, the great thing about, to, to read your question a different way, the answer would be yes in terms of, the great thing about not having a paper here is that you can just decide, oh, we'll do that as a podcast, we'll do that as a piece of film, we'll do that as a graph, whatever, and it will work on all the platforms, mostly all the platforms catching up, it will work on everything. And so in that way, you just make the decision based on what feels right for telling the story and you bung it up and you don't need to do it different ways. Maybe that wasn't your question. So, it, so in that sense, yes, it is just publishing. I think also there is just this um, absolute shake up in terms of how we approach a story and how we tell it. And we certainly think like that as well, about slicing it to something very small. And we find, like the HuffPo, that the engaging, short, snappy stuff is the stuff that shares. Mm. But also I think there are, you know, we're making a documentary at BuzzFeed, a 90-minute documentary. I think some of the most amazing stuff last year was the stuff that Vice did with Islamic State in, in Syria. Um, and I think that people do actually, like I'm somebody who hasn't had a television the whole time, I've lived in Australia five years, I think people do watch long form stuff, long mm. video stuff on their phones and certainly throw it to their computers or whatever. So I think that, um, yeah, I think th there's definitely a big future um, for that kind of documentary style stuff on, on, on uh, the internet, definitely. Okay. I think what it's done is it, it's thrown the shackles off those who thought of themselves as print journalists and mm. their life is going to be ruled by the 600 word lead and then maybe they get to the, d do the 2000 feature and certainly, you know, and I know there's a lot of students in the room, that, that's a remarkable thing to look at a career that won't be bound, you know, that says if I'm a visual person but I end up working on a newspaper I have to forget all that or I won't be able to exploit that and I think that's a young... You know, I've certainly seen it at the Age newsroom. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity for people to suddenly start thinking differently. And the amazing thing is that, obviously, we've heard this a lot. Everyone's a journalist. Everyone's a citizen journalist. We did um, a thing that, you know, with Periscope, we interviewed Joe Hockey a day after the budget in his office, and that was with an iPhone, nothing else, no other piece of technology. We did this interview that people around Australia were watching. And so, you know, the, the playing field is much more level now. Everyone can kind of get involved and, yeah. and do stuff. Periscope's very exciting. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't looked at it should. Um, we'll take another question. Please, yeah. uh, please uh, um, I want to ask a question. Uh, sorry, I'm using African intonation, uh, believing that you understand me. Well, I, I want to say something about, uh, you made mention of uh, if there is any particular thing that is being underrepresented by journalists here. And a lot of people scan through different issues, but there is this major issue that as I'm not a citizen, but as a foreigner, I discovered that problem in Australia, and that is the issue of terrorism. Uh, the fact there is that uh, most people who are, who are really hitting the nail uh, in the head are being denied, are being like sidelined in, in the media, in the print media, in the sense that uh, I, I see terrorism as dissenting as pedophile, the way they treat pedophile. But in Australia, they don't tend to do things proactively. They tend to wait whenever the problem engulf the society. They start, uh, journalists will start printing it. There is this fact there, I'm, I was a Muslim. In, in Islam, there is this political ideology in Islam that really tend to propagate hate for people who are anti, who are not Islamic. But once anybody uh, raise it, if an Australian raise it, people will start saying the person is a racist. Well, just is there a, is there a Andrew, question? Andrew, Bolt, Andrew Bolt's column this morning, I happen to know, in the Sydney Telegraph was 1,800 words saying exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly yeah. your point. He was yeah, arguing yeah. In, a, in, a, in a major tabloid. Yeah. So, so like people like Ian Ali, all these people have read, have read uh, Arabic right from childhood. There are things that are in Islam that the government should start looking at. Excuse me, really. sir, I might just interrupt you there yeah. and ask the panel to respond. Yeah, I think yeah, we've got yeah, the, the tenor I, yeah, of your comment. Yeah. I think what's really yeah. important and what we're trying to do with a small newsroom is actually tell really positive stories about um, Muslim Australia and Islamic Australia. And so we sent a reporter to Shepparton uh, where there's been a very successful integration in a country Victorian town of a big Sudanese Muslim population. And it's been very surprising because I think people thought, oh, this, you know, the, the stereotypical view externally outside of Australia and often within Australia is that like basically Australians don't want Muslim people anywhere. 
And obviously we're seeing, and we've been reporting on Bendigo as well, where there's problems with mosques that are going up there. But actually we're really looking at, as well as reporting um, those kind of things, actually reporting positive stories as well about um, our, what I think is a wonderful multicultural society that generally uh, is actually really harmonious and, and there's, there's only certain things that are causing friction which kind of do get blown up by the media. Yeah, so it's incumbent on us to kind of report these things, I think. Mm. Tori, did you want to respond? Well, I, just, I wasn't sure what the question was. I thought it was more of a statement about yeah. Islam, <laughs> to be honest. So Yes, well, I suppose, the, I suppose the question is, if I can try and attempt to paraphrase yeah. the gentleman, was, um, you know, is the, is the media accurately representing the issues with um, Islamic communities in Australia? and the issues that arise around terrorism? Oh, look, you know, we could do a whole panel on that, couldn't we? Mm. Um, some would say they are and some would say they aren't. And, you know, there, there is certainly some very loud rhetoric at the moment, but mm. the government has actually toned down the way it's talking about these issues in the last couple of weeks mm. and is, um, is taking the conversation more into an examination of society as a whole, not just mm. as a, you know, as a simplistic discussion. And I think that's something the entire media can engage in. But mm. I, it's also one of those topics where people are going to be looking for their point of view to be re reinforced to them. Mm. Andrew, did you want to add anything? Oh, look, I disagree with you. I disagree with Andrew Bolt. But the beauty of our media is that mm. people get the opportunity to express their differing views. And, and it's that not only the diversity of the newsroom, but the diversity of opinions that makes this such a, a strong culture. We should have the opportunity to argue it and debate it. That, and and the, the more outlets we have to contribute to that debate, the better. And it's just, it, it is, it, it's definitely a thing. There are young people going and fighting overseas just as they went overseas from England in the 1930s to Spain or whatever. And it's definitely a thing that there are there have been these two, well, the, the Sydney siege and then this shooting and there was the, the death in Melbourne. But there are also other much, there are other stories rumbling on with much higher death counts in Australia. I read a story today about a, 12, a court case about allegedly a 12-year-old girl being to death with a bed slat by a man in a family home. And there's, I don't know how many women die a week from domestic violence. Anyway, so it's just, it is just one thread to unpick in Australia and it's not an overwhelming mm. panic kind of thread. And I might say just bouncing off that, that mm. our first session at the new news tomorrow is mm. about the media's reporting of violence against women and, mm. and what has changed and to what mm. extent that changed. We'll take one more short question then I'm going to reserve the right to ask the last one myself. Um, so one more question. Hi, um, Michael Rodden. Um, thanks for talking. With new journalism, Journalist brands is like really important, especially like in something like BuzzFeed, um, but I guess in, in everywhere else as well. Uh, are you worried, the four of you, about how much your journalists curate their own brand as a way to bring people into your site if they leave? Like say like, what if Mark DeSteph leaves or something like that? Or, you know, important Guardian writers who have a, a huge following on Twitter, like... Well, but you know that 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 sort of that predates the internet really. I remember years ago having a, a UK columnist called Charlie Brooker, and I was always having to creep round him in case he left when I was a junior commissioning editor. Still at the Guardian. He's still at the Guardian, yeah. He still he got big. He's still there, and and yeah, sure, <laughs> you you get these people who become kind of megastars. But to balance it out, you have 140 million global readers, so yeah. and your structure and support. And we had it, with, you know, Glenn Greenwald worked for us in. in in America, and, and he left, and you could argue you'd have done better. I don't actually stay think the journalist brand is as big an influence as you, maybe your question implied you think it is. Um, I, you know, I think it works for some people, and that's great, but I don't think it's the entire reason why people go, like HuffPost has 220 million readers around the world, and most of them wouldn't be able to name a single person there except Ariana Huffington, and even a lot of them wouldn't be able to name her. Um, I think that the, um, I think, a, an outlet's brand and its voice and its standards are much more important than the names of the people who are writing the content. And the smart journalists realise that organisations will allow them, encourage them to do the sort of journalism they want to do and protect them. So Kate McClymont, for example, who's one of the biggest names in Australia, knows she would never go freelance. 
Because she needs Fairfax to protect her from the many, many defamation suits that her doing. <laughs> yeah. huh? yeah. and, and she needs Fairfax to pay Eddie O'B between half a million and a million dollars in cash when, we, when he sued us 10 years ago. And we've proved he's a crook. And people don't um, read the, Kate McClymont because she's big on Twitter. They read Kate McClymont because yeah. she breaks amazing yarns. So, so, it's, so it's a symbiotic relationship. Twitter is actually like, you know, somewhere where people in the news politics who engage with the news are really engaged, but actually, and Mark is very aware of this as well, that you know, a thing that's retweeted a hundred times, yeah, that looks great, but actually what we're looking for is a story that's read a hundred thousand times in Australia, and they're completely different things, and the vast percentage of our audience are somewhere else on the internet, and so Twitter's a great place to report and to build out stories and to dig deep and to crowdsource and those things, a very useful tool, but ultimately it's actually how the story works for the brand is actually the biggest thing. And also thing. personal brands can flame out. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, but I could name so many people I know who for five minutes were the hot thing mm. and mm. no one could remember what their name is. <laughs> um. Okay. Um, now, we are out of time, but I'm going to ask you each in the listicle tradition to answer this question with just one word, and that is, Short what list. will we be talking about next year in this session at the New News? Tori. Oh. Um... Probably, hopefully, much bigger newsrooms. Bigger newsrooms? Instead Emily? of shrinking newsrooms. Money, always the money. Simon? I think Snapchat. Snapchat? Oh. Andrew? I was gonna, it's depressing. I was going to agree with Emily, the money, unfortunately. With a bit like what we're talking about in the election, that'll be fun. <laughs> okay. The election will be then gone by then, will they not? Well, we can still talk about it. Well, that brings well. this session and this first day of the new news to a close. Thank you very much for being here today, and please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.